Joshua chapter 2 And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and came into an harlot's house named Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither to night of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I was not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, whither the man went I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up upon them, upon the roof. And she said unto the man, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amartes. They were on the other side Jordan, Sirhorn and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have, and deliver out lives from death. And the man answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be, when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days, until the pursuers be returned. And afterward may ye go your way. And the man said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, we will come into the land. Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thine house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so it be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window, and they went, and came unto the mountain, and aboard there three days, until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned, and descended from the mountain, and passed over, and came to Joshua the son of Nun, and told him all things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Amen. Continuing on our journey through Joshua chapter 2. We find Joshua begins there in verse 1. And it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly. Okay. So the last time, which was Numbers chapter 13, that a promised land was spied out, there was 12 sent. And at that time, 
who brought forth a good report? And I had to wonder to myself, is Joshua maybe troubled at this? Another opportunity to send spies to check out a land, to search out the land. I don't know if he was worried that they would come back, bring an evil report which would cause frustration and fear and anguish to come upon the people, and therefore 40 more years would be paid would be spent then in a wilderness state. But instead of 12 this time, perhaps he felt it uh, more fitting to send just the two. Maybe they were close to him. He, he knew that they were men similar to how Caleb and him, himself were back then, 40 years earlier. But also, I think there's a pattern here of sending, and there's two by two by two by two. Here is a pattern that we see in the New Testament for going and, and preaching the gospel to the lost. Sending forth men two by two seems to bring a, a, higher, uh, a higher success rate than that of sending a dozen out at once, and uh, we see that biblically here. So, the last time again in Numbers chapter 13, the spying of the land didn't go so well for them, but Joshua nevertheless sends these two, and the Bible says in the second part of that verse 1, go view the land, even Jericho, and they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. So, specifically, Rahab here is referred to as an harlot, okay? So this isn't someone's interpretation of her. This isn't um, an observation made from someone else. Rather, this is specifically the narrator talking. If you look, it says, Joshua sent the spies saying, go view the land, even Jericho. There's the period. Now the narrator steps in, which is the Holy Spirit of God, and it says, and they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab. So this is according to the narrator that specifically and presently she remains a harlot. This is the present reality of this woman named Rahab. But I believe God had begun to work on her. And as is often the case, sometimes people will have an encounter with God. Maybe they believe to the saving of their soul. They're born again, but they remain in that old state for a little while before transformation starts to take place. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, Rahab here, she's coming to a point in her life where God is beginning to work with her. And I believe in the course of the scriptures in the next few chapters, she's going to transition out of that unharlot, um, basically, present reality. That, that statement that she actually is, according to the narrator, an harlot, which is somebody that is promiscuous, which is somebody that, that, um, that is in fornication. Um, and it's not often, though some people will say so, it's not often for the sake of financial gain. And harlot is a broad term. It's not just a prostitute, which would be the one that does it for money. That being said, the Bible does say very specifically that to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And I believe at this time... The harlot Rahab is righteous, justified in the sight of God, though her works do not reflect that. And we know that in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 31, the Bible records Jesus saying that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before thee. And he was talking then to the religious. He was talking to those that had the works, that had the good deeds, but they were trusting in those things. And Jesus, very honest with them, says, you know what? These that have an unclean lifestyle, these that haven't straightened up, these that don't look right, follow the part, look like they would be a Christian in your sight, those are the ones that are going to enter the kingdom of God before thee. He used another example when dealing with, um, I believe, Mary Magdalene. He said that she loved much as a result of the fact that she was forgiven much. And so we see here the harlot, the harlot Rahab enters this scene, but she's one with that big heart and that big desire to show faith unto her Savior who wants to seek her, who wants to get a hold of her and yes, save her soul, but also transform her works. Jesus Christ has the heart to reach those harlots and publicans. He has the heart to reach those that are of a humble and contrite spirit in spite of the sins that they may be caught up in at that present time. We know Jesus often supped with the publicans and the harlots and the sinners, and that was a major affront in his ministry in the eyes of the, the religious sect of the Pharisees, scribes, and, and what have you. 
But Jesus' heart was towards those people that needed him the most, it seems. She was then, I believe, moving to reform. And regardless of the present state that she was in, according to the narrator of the scriptures, she was about to show a huge amount of faith towards the Lord. And without faith, it is indeed impossible to please God. And so we know that in Hebrews chapter 11 and 25, we've been there. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab, and here's her works, received the spies with peace. And that's what's going to happen here in Joshua chapter 2, as we just read. It says also in James chapter 2 and verse 25, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out the other way? In other words, her faith was proven in the eyes of those that were around her, justified. Her faith was justified by the work that is about to happen here again in Joshua chapter 2. She received the messengers and then sent them out another way, therefore preserving their life from certain attacks that were about to come. So the key points that we see just in looking at Rahab and knowing that there are two references to her in the New Testament, other references to Rahab, just as an aside, is like a poetic name for um, Egypt, I believe. So if you're reading in Psalms and in, uh, in some of the kings um, or the prophets, I believe, you'll find Rahab mentioned there. But that's just a poetic term used to cover Egypt and the world. But this Rahab, this lady is mentioned twice in the New Testament. Hebrews 11, James chapter 2. And what we've gathered from her story thus far is that your reputation, unfortunately, often stays with you even after you're saved. Isn't that the case? Your reputation among those especially that knew you before can stick with you, whether it's the drunk or the the harlot here according to Rahab or the gambler or the whatever men perceived you as before you were saved often that will be how they typify you forever unfortunately but I believe that we can use that the New Testament actually gives us credence to that is that sometimes it's a great and miraculous story of transformation that God would allow those things to stick with you. Why? Someday you go and you bump into somebody and they'll be like, hey, you still partying like you used to? You still drinking? You want to go party? And you can say, you know what? No. I've, I've been transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ. And now I don't do those things anymore. And you can use that as a strong testimony. Now you may often run into people that remember you a certain way and your reputation will often stick with you among family, among friends, among those that you knew in your past life. But use it rather. The Bible doesn't encourage us to just forget those things and acknowledge they never existed. The Bible actually says, remember the pit from whence thou were dug. In other words, remember the stone that you were hewn from. Remember the dirt that you were in. Don't forget that pig pen that God pulled you out of, but rather use that as a testimony of God's saving grace and power to transform your life. Another key point that we get from her is that, yes, absolutely, the Lord justifies the ungodly by faith, and his view of you is ultimately what matters. Never mind what other people say. Here the narrator affirms that at this present time, she was a harlot, but didn't we read in the New Testament that they were still calling her Rahab the harlot, referring back and showing that while you are justified by faith and saved by Christ, sometimes your reputation stick with you. But ultimately, God lifted her up in two major points of the scriptures where he wants to just lift up great works done in faith. Rahab made those rolls and made those marks, and she was pleasing in the eyes of God in spite of what the world thought of her. She was commended. She was honored for the great faith that she showed in this moment here in Joshua chapter 2. Though she was marked by her past, though she would have still shown scars from her past, she would have probably and most likely had remorse of her past and probably beat herself up as being Rahab the harlot just as much as the world around her would have, if not more. Sometimes that probably bothered her at night that she had lived the way she did. Nevertheless, commended, honored, the eyes of God well-pleasing in his sight. Why? Because she was a faithful woman. 
So understand these two points about this woman Rahab. We're going to continue on in the narrative now. In verse 2, it says, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight to the children of Israel to search out the country. Now, very plainly, they saw them coming in. Whether they had good surveillance, I don't know, but it was, it was seen. They didn't sneak in as secretly as they would have hoped for. And so the king was now made aware of the fact that these two spies were present. Verse 3 continues, and it says, And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, Okay, saying, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out the country. Now, two things came to my mind when I saw that, that phrase that the king sent unto Rahab. Bring forth the men that have come to thee. Either the same surveillance that happened in verse 2 so that they could see the spies enter into the city, then enter into Rahab's house had taken place, and they watched them the whole way. Either that took place and they were just witness going in there or unfortunately it was very common for those that visited Jericho made a stop there at Rahab's house because of her reputation as being a harlot. I don't know what it is, but regardless, we see then that the king saw and knew that they had entered into that place at such a time. Whether by surveillance or whether by presumption. Okay, so we have to keep in mind again the commendation of this woman, regardless of her reputation. She is named among the great heroes of faithing, of, of showing their faith, acting out their faith in Hebrews chapter 11, but also specifically in James chapter 2 when it refers to this act that she's about to do, receiving the messengers and sending them out, of the, out another way, this act specifically justified her works. In other words, proved the faith that she had by the work that she is about to do. Okay, Keep that in mind as we read what exactly transpires in this story. Verse two, 4, sorry, verse 4. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus. So now she took the two men, hid them away, and she's going to talk back to those that were sent from the king. She says, there came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. In other words, they came unto me, but I don't know whence they were. I don't know where they came from. I don't know that they're the children of Israel, as you said. And it said in verse 5, And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out, whither the men went, I wot not, Pursue after them quickly, and ye shall overtake them. Okay? So two things had just taken place here. One, she says, I didn't know that they were the children of Israel. And secondly, she said, hey, they came here, but they're gone. They went out. Where they went, I have no idea. She's lied twice here, has she not? We find out the uh, soon after that she has lied because it says there in verse 6, but she had brought them up to the roof, knowing specifically where they were. So she couldn't claim, I want not whether they went, because she put them there. And it says that, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof, almost as if she'd prepared a hiding place. Again, perhaps pointing to her reputation and, and what she was known for, and that's being a harlot. Having a place where she could hide men, okay? Not the, not the greatest of, of um, witness that we find of her and of her home and of her abode here in the scriptures. But again, remember the commendation. God didn't frown upon this act. Okay, it continues then on. And it says, um, well, we see then that she bared false witness. Clearly a sin according to the Ten Commandments. It says also in the book of revelation whosoever maketh a lie is someone not worthy of the kingdom of god so what is it that justifies this act when we have her lying twice here should we then take romans chapter 3 and verse 8 where it says shall we do evil that good may come and the apostle paul says god forbid because it's obviously good that those men were preserved alive those those men that were spies for the children of israel but she did evil in order to facilitate that. What is happening here in this story? 
Whatever it is, we see though then, regardless of what we may perceive about it, that God commended this very act, saying that it justified the faith that she had in this exact moment. She was a believer. And what she did justified and proved the fact that she was a believer. Some points to notice here. First of all, this is a unique situation. So we can't take the fact that Rahab lied about what was going on in her house and just make precedent about it. Right? The Apostle Paul makes that very clear in that rhetorical question. Shall we do evil that good may come? In other words, do the ends justify the means? Can we just do bad things in order that good would come and, and have that as a logical end and that be a good thing? No, it's not. In fact, that's a, that's a, a, a method that's used in Judaism as well as um, Islam, I believe, is that ultimately the ends justify the means. And that's even a, a satanic mantra. They will do whatever they can in order to, ju in order to, prove, in order to have an end come. And, and, and this is not of God. This is, this is a satanic principle. But this is a unique situation, so don't make precedent over it. The next thing that you want, you want to notice is that she indeed was justified. In other words, proven faithful to men when she did this very act, did this very work. It was commended by God. And, and third, and what I think is the key point here, is that it would have been a greater sin for her. And we're not in the business of measuring sins per se. Don't make a precedent, precedent again. It would be a greater sin for Rahab at this time to hinder the work of God. And we're going to see that she knew at this time both that this was the children of Israel and she knew that they needed to be hidden lest they be destroyed because their report had to go back to Joshua. So she said in verse 7, the men pursued after them, here's some narrative, and the way of to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Verse 8, and behold, they and before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. So they were about to get comfortable in the stalks of flax that she had prepared. She comes up before that takes place. And look what she says in verse 9. She says three important points. She said unto the man, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. And that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. She made a statement that was biblically accurate. In other words, she had some understanding of what the scripture said about the promised land and about what was transpiring before her eyes. Maybe she didn't understand it all. Maybe she'd only heard it by word of mouth, by some testimony. Maybe she had a portion of the scriptures, though I don't think that's too likely. Regardless... She had had an encounter with God, and God had revealed some things to her. First thing she said, I know the Lord hath given you the land. Well, how does she know that? Way back in Genesis chapter 12, and verse 7, it says, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And this was the land that Abraham, of course, walked into when he left his home on a promise that God had made him. Unto thy seed will I give this land. That's how Rahab knew that the Lord hath given them this land, because God had said it. She says also here that your terror is fallen upon us. In Genesis 35, verse 5, the Bible records, The terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. So as Israel traveled about in Genesis chapter 35, and the people of God went forward, there was a terror that fell upon them. Why? Because the people knew that the Lord God Almighty was with them. Next thing that we notice, all the inhabitants of the land faint because of of you. Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 25 says, This day, this is a promise at the beginning of our study of Deuteronomy, this day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole heaven, who shall hear report of thee and shall tremble and be in anguish because of thee. Dread, fear, trembling, anguish upon all nations that are around them. You think that would cause them to faint? I do. They're faint. They've lost all power. They've lost all might for the fight and the battle that would be ahead of them. They've given up all hope because they knew that God was with them. And the fear of God came upon um, the people and therefore they also feared the people of God at this time. And so she knew then 
that this was God's will that was transpiring before her eyes. Verse 10, it says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. So remember how God said that that testimony of the Red Sea would go far and wide? And through Pharaoh and that event, and the whole reason why he hardened his heart, and the whole reason why God rose up Pharaoh for such a time as this, was that the whole world would hear this very testimony of the Word of God. It had come to Rahab, this lowly harlot in her house, even in Jericho, that the Lord had dried up the water of the Red Sea. And it says, When ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Now watch this. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth above beneath. And while the men around her and the the king and and his people and his army, their hearts fainted and melted away for the report that they heard that those same people that the Lord dried up the Red Sea and destroyed the greatest army in Egypt in the world for, those same people were now on their borders. The men and and the the majority of the city, I believe, hearts failed them and they and they had just given up all hope. I believe here, actually, it shows that Rahab did a different thing with that fear that came upon her. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Most men deny that and reject that. She transformed that into something good. And instead of the fear causing her to tremble and causing her to to just give up hope and melt away, she used that fear to turn to God and say, you know what, your God, he is God. Your God, he's the God of heaven above. He's the God in earth beneath. He is the Lord God Almighty, creator of heaven and of earth, ruler over the same. I believe she repented, believed on Christ, believed on God Almighty God and what she knew of him in that day. She gave him her faith. And so... Now, knowing God's will, knowing God's work, and knowing God, saying your God is God of heaven and earth, and knowing exactly who he is, is God Almighty, she says in verse 12, Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed kindness, that ye will show kindness unto my Father's house, and give me a true token. So because I've showed kindness Will you also show kindness? And do you know what that means that she did? It means that she did unto others as she would have done unto herself. They're showing already some transformation taking place. She's acting out Christian, Christ-like principles from the New Testament way back there in the sixth book of the Bible, showing kindness and asking kindness the same. Why? Because she showed what she would hope would be returned unto herself. She asked them then, show kindness to my father's house. And what did she want? Give me a true token. That's the first thing she requested. And that was what is mentioned in verse 18, that scarlet thread. And she also says, and give me a promise. In verse 13 it says, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. She says, give me a sign, which was that scarlet thread. Thread. She says, give me a promise that you would save alive my family and all that they possess when you come in and certainly destroy this land. She accepted the promise of God, but wanted to bring some others along with it to reap, reap the benefits of it. She was given that scarlet thread, as it were. She was given salvation, as it were, in a, in a type and in a picture here. And the first thing she wanted to do with that blessing of God. And and even the blessing that God's people would come and choose her house to abide with her. So that she could receive that promise from these two spies that came two by two to her door. To show her the more excellent way. And to offer her a way of escape as it were. It looks like soul winning, doesn't it? She says, will you also save a life? Will you also have this message available for my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all that they have. She wanted them to also be saved. Amazing. Verse 14. And the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business, 
And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward ye may go your way. And so fulfills all of the events that are talked about in James chapter 2, and all the events that are talked about in Hebrews chapter 11 with respect to Rahab. She sent them out another way after receiving them with peace. And therefore, her works here justified the faith that she now had toward the living God. She was saved. She was born again. And she was showing it through this act. That being said, there was probably still other things in her life that she had yet to clear up. But that's okay. God accepts her. God, God acknowledges her faithfulness. God gave her a prominent spot in the New Testament. Whenever faith is talked about, and the mighty works that, is so, that accompany the faith that she had, that any would have, she's always mentioned. She's always named there. James and Hebrews. Two prominent pictures of the most faithful people we have recorded in the scriptures and otherwise. And she's named among them. What a blessing that is, that, the, Rahab, that the, the harlot, as they call her, Rahab, would have that to her name. So in verse 17 it says, And the man said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house home unto thee. It shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head. If any hands be upon him. And if thou utter this our business... Then will we be quit of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. So this sounds similar then to the Passover promise. Except she has this line of scarlet thread put upon the window. And in the time of Exodus they put it upon the doorpost. But the, the stipulation was the same. You take your own blood upon you if you leave this house. But if you stay in then the blood is somebody else's. There was a lamb. Here it is, a scarlet thread, just by picture, a red thread, a red piece of cloth, a red garment in the same likeness of the promise. If you have it there and you're in the house, the destroyer will not come and destroy. And here, these say, look, we will be blameless. These two spies say, we will be blameless if, first, you leave the house, Secondly, you don't put the thread up there. And thirdly, you utter any of our business. Look, she was putting her faith in them to follow through with their side of the bargain. She had some things to do in order to fulfill her side of the bargain. And you know what? Our interactions with God are the same way, right? We're by faith trusting God has made a promise. He simply says, do something like this. Put blood on the doorpost. Stay inside. He gives you an act to do to justify the faith that you have. Look, you believe God the second he says the word and you accept it and say, yep, I'll do that. And then you justify that faith that you have when you actually carry forth and do what is asked and requested of you. Your actions have nothing to do with, in the realm of salvation, your eternal home in heaven. That's settled by faith. God made sure to do all the works with respect to that. But with respect to blessing, with respect to keeping your family alive in this case, with respect to having your house and home saved when there's, a, when there's an attack on your city, and any other promise that God would give you here in this life, there's usually works associated with that. What are you doing? You're simply believing God by faith. Yes, that's great and wonderful, but don't sit on your hands. God says, now act out that faith that I have worked in. 
We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, but as God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, we ought to get unto good works. We ought to do good works from the position that we are saved. We have salvation sealed and with us. Now get to work with that and receive of promises God makes with respect to the world that we live in and our time that we have here. All throughout Deuteronomy, they were learning that lesson. And now it's amazing because through the acts that went on and were, were basically looked back on from Deuteronomy, so we're talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and we learned about what happened in Deuteronomy, pointing back to the acts that had transpired. All of that took place and got to here, this woman in this small town, the small city that was about to be utterly destroyed in fulfillment of all the promises of God. She had the same interaction with God Almighty God, just as he, he said was his goal and just as he had promised when he raised up Pharaoh, when he destroyed Pharaoh. He wanted that to be a testimony to the world that fear and dread would fall upon them and they'd either faint or they'd show him faith. And join his side. Be on the side numbered with God. Saved by the blood of the crucified one that would come many, many, many years later. And so, she acts it out. She does exactly what's expected even of a Christian. Look, she was, she was encountered at the beginning of this chapter as a harlot. The narrator said it. She's a harlot. She's still got some profound issues in her life. But it's amazing that God used those things in her life to actually cause that she could get involved in this fight by faith. How is that? How is that? What well, we saw there, she had already prepared the roof where she could hide men. Unfortunately, that was, that was a remnant thing of her past life. She was also known as somebody that would receive men, not saying that the children of Israel knew that, but the king of Jericho, knowing that being her reputation, went there and therefore she was able to confound the men that were in that place and send them out another way another thing that was a part of her life before is just the ability to know the scene know the surroundings and manipulate these men to go wherever they will okay these are all the basically traits of her life from the past that aren't the greatest okay but god used them nevertheless and you know what the your past Though you're ashamed of it and though it bothers you to no end and you wish you could erase it, God even wants to use those things for his glory and for his benefit. It's amazing. When I think about what's gone on in my past, things that I regret and don't look upon, how God's now using them now for his glory. Just that guitar is one example. When I picked up a guitar, do you know what I wanted to play? Dun, 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 dun. Metal music, loud music, rock and roll, that type of thing. God's now using it for his glory to sing hymns of praise. And now we have, we have a functioning instrument that we can all use for his glory at the, such a time as this. And that's just one of the many things that God uses from my past in order to get glory today. And he did the same with her. She was saved. She was used even in the state that she was in. Then she showed faith by acting out exactly what God wanted her to do to save alive these spies so that they could go back and report positively and, and well of what Israel is about to encounter as they enter into Jericho. Not only that, she was used to not just herself get saved, but see her family saved because they, by faith in what she had said and the fear that had come upon them, entered into her abode and they're about to receive of the promise of god in the chapters that will come up but basically the framework has been given to her at this time verse 21 it continues it said and she said according to your words so be it they've agreed now they've covenanted in this area and she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line in the window there it's bound they've left the house she's promised not to utter their business and she's going to start welcoming her family in at this time, I believe. And it says, And they went, verse 22, and came unto the mountain, and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned, and the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. And so they listened to her wisdom about the surroundings and where they could go to hide and then be secure. And that was part of the promise that was made in James chapter 2 and in verse 25. Sent them out another way and preserved them alive. So here's the report that gets back as a result of all that's taken place. Verse 23. So the men returned 
and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all things that befell them. So they reiterate the whole story. They tell of the scene. They, they give report of Jericho. And what is it? It's a good report. Verse 24, And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. And they're not even just saying that this promise applies to Jericho at this time and in this hour. They're saying, Truly God has given us all the land. Truly all of the promises that were made from Genesis into Deuteronomy are going to come true. Praise the Lord. Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land. Why? For even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us and because of the terror of God and because the great fear that he promised back in Deuteronomy chapter 2 would begin to fall upon these people it has transpired and they're seeing before their eyes the miracles and the provision and the wonderful promise of God coming to pass. And it all stemmed from and it all happened as a result of this one woman known as a harlot who had that reputation, unfortunately, carried in even to the New Testament. God used her mightily in order to fulfill this very act. I think it would have been a very different thing if they stumbled into another building and they were found out and they were destroyed and Joshua was waiting time and time and time and they just don't come back and he finds out later that they were killed there in Jericho. And who knows how the, that would be received by the people of Israel, whether they would retaliate in anger and, and show that as, as the spirit by which they entered into the city, rather than of faith, they go in by anger and want revenge, which rightly belongs to God, or whether they would just faint as a result of their beloved spies, these two that Joshua had chosen because they fell and because they were consumed by that nation. So many different things we can ponder and we can pontificate about what might have transpired, but what we see that actually transpired was this wonderful story of this great redeemed and, and gradually reforming woman, Rahab, what she did and how she showed out her faith through the work that she did here. And it's a wonderful story. And I'm glad that God recorded it. I'm glad that we now know Rahab. Look forward to meeting that wonderful lady in time to come. Thank you.